is east and west is west and the wrong one I have chose. Let's go where I'll keep on wearing those frills and flowers and buttons and bows, rings and things and buttons and bows. Don't bury me in the prairie. Seasoned citizens present. Our subject today is memories of yesterday's pearl industry. I'm Hallie Shankle, and my guest today is Walter Jensen. Walter has worked for 20 years at a button factory, and I have worked for 30, so we thought we'd kind of reminisce and tell you a few facts. Hello there, Walter. How are you today? Okay, Hallie. Let's start from the very beginning, shall we? Right from the very first till the final button. Let's see, what would be the very first thing that would be? Well, we're we're talking about memories, and of course, at our age, some of the memories that we had, or some of the th things that went on, we may not be able to remember, so you may have to help me out a little bit on that. <laughs> but, Mine's uh, a little shorter too, Walter. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the first process in making the pearl buttons was the uh, obtaining the, the mussel shells out of the, out of the rivers, and uh, our Mississippi River here was one of the, what you might say, richest places for mussel shells at that particular time in those, year, right. in those years. And uh, there were various other rivers over the country, around the country. I think and in the south there was some rivers. In, that... in the south, yes. But uh, right out, just right off of Muscatine here, uh, you, you could look as you could see on numerous boats out there selling for these mussel shells. Now, uh, the boats that they used, uh, or some of them uh, had different type boats, but the most common boat was what they used to call the John boat, or a flat boat. And uh, it probably was, perhaps was 16 to maybe 18 foot long, depend. And uh, on each side of the boat, they would have uh, a couple of poles stuck up, and uh, on each side, and then they would have a long pole on each side with strings or uh, fish line usually, and uh, with a treble hook or three prong hook or sometimes four prong, and they were, well, I would say, at least four four inches or so. It kind of like a, a crow's foot or well, some crow's sort of, sort of, foot. Uh, they, some I of them think call that was the name foot. of it. Uh -huh. But actually, they what they were. There were three, three prongs that came out like that, and uh, the shelling was a good deal like fishing. You thought there was a good place to maybe be some shells there, which is like the fishing you'd throw your line in. Well, that's what the shellers were doing those days. They would drop these two poles off each side of the boat, let them hit the bottom of the river, and then float down the river. And the clam shell itself would lie on the bottom of the river, and have its its uh, uh, have, it would be open, yeah. so they could get any food or anything that came down for, from the river. And uh, as these hooks dragged along, if that hook would happen to hit one of these clams, he immediately would close up, right, and stay on. He would stay on the hook. Then he wouldn't open up again. He'd stay on the hook, and uh, they would more or less. Experienced uh, sheller could tell pretty pretty well when he had a pretty good load of clams on there, and then they would bring them up, hang them up on the hooks, and take them off of the hooks, throw them in the bottom of the boat, and go through the same process again. Well, now what would they do after they had obtained these shells and they got to shore? Then what would they do with them? Well, they usually they would pile them up. Each uh, uh, guy that clammed or or shelled, we might say. I would uh, pick out a certain spot on the shore, and that would be his spot where he would dump his shells. And uh, maybe they'd do that for three or four days till they get a pretty good size uh, uh, pile of shells. And uh, then they would take time and they'd either use a tank or maybe a barrel or something and heat that real hot with water and would throw these shells in with the clam in the hot water. Oh, to cook the meat out. And to cook the meat out, yes. And uh, then, then they would have the process of opening the clam up and cutting that meat out 
and uh, throw it away. Now, some some of the fellows, I was talking to a fellow the other day, and uh, they used to shell, and he said that he would sell them to the farmers and he would feed the, the clams to the to the hogs. And uh, But as far as eating the clams, there was no no way that you could eat them. But I think they, they used to, shell, too, for chickens. The, well, uh, I think, the, they, the, the I think shell, the farmers yeah. sometimes yeah, used a broken later, shell for chicken feed, yeah, too. Later, later on, yeah. But, uh, and once they got the shells uh, uh, separated and, and broke from the hinges, uh, then they would pile them up, and then, of course, there would be the different uh, various various types of shells. You Oh, there was a lot of them, I guess. Yes. I could name a few. Yes. Let's I, see, there was a pimpleback, and there was um, a mucket, and a sand shell, and a niggerhead. And if I'm not mistaken, the niggerhead was about the best shell yes, that there was, was more so for a cutting butt. You were iridescent. And then there was a uh, washboard. Yeah, now this, this Oh, this yes, you have a washboard, washboard there. Now, as you notice how rough that is on the, the washboard on the back of it. That's why they call them the washboard. I and see, uh -huh. as you see on the inside, there's a lot of iridescent uh, that uh, this, this type of shell made a very good iridescent button. Right. And as you will notice later on, we'll tell uh, the different spot, I mean the different uh, grades of buttons, you'll notice how spotted those are in places. And yes. when, when they were cut out of the shell, that remains in there and through, all through the process of Sure, the so those would have to be graded yeah. out, wouldn't they? And uh, now here I have a small shell which already has some of the blanks cut out. Now this is also a washboard. See, it's rough like that. And uh, the, They uh, said that they could make sometimes cut from six to eight buttons out of one shell. Yes, well, depend you, upon size. you can see here, they've got four out of this small one. This one here, uh, they could they could cut some large ones out of here and they get down in here, then they cut the smaller ones. I so uh, that was one thing about a button cutter. Uh, when, he, when he was told to cut a certain amount of shells or a certain amount of blanks out of a button, if he was a real good one, he could get as many as he could possibly out of there. And the poor, Poor ones, he, he probably couldn't. No, that's true. Cut cut it as, as well, well as. Well, then he, after these shells was processed to that extent, then they were <coughs> taken to cutting plants. Was there? And there were a lot of cutting plants in Muscatine, wasn't yes. there? Yes. Uh, Even in behind homes or in homes, there was cutting plants too, wasn't there? Yeah, there would be various. I I know I can remember of, uh, some friends of mine, and they would have a shed in the back, and they would have maybe three or four cutting machines, what they would call cutting machines. And uh, they would have the neighbors come in, and they would cut all day long. And uh, they would contract with a certain manufacturer and uh, sell their blanks and that they got. Uh, they would have to buy the shells, of course, or if they shelled themselves, of course. Mm -hmm. But then they would sell them back to the factory to be made in, into buttons. Now. Uh, they would be put in gunny sacks and hauled with horse and wagon to yeah. these different places. Oh yeah, places, there wasn't, they? wasn't much uh, later. Later on, years they had trucks, but right. then, but uh, in the earlier times, and uh, of course we go back. Well, be uh, before nineteen eleven because nineteen eleven is when we had the the large strike here in in Muscatine. I see. And the mm -hmm. button cutters, and uh, that was before my time because I didn't get here till about twenty nineteen twenty three moving to town here. Well, now, after these shells has been processed, and then they uh, do the cutting, uh, then they were sent to larger factories, weren't they? Yes. I might say that when they were cut, this was one of the things, the primary things that, that you would uh, use to hold the shell. Now, I never did see a button cut. Of right. all the time I worked in a factory, I never saw a button cut. So what you're telling me, I'm really interested yes. in, because I had no idea how it was done. Well, I worked, I worked for 20 years at a button factory too, and I never cut a shell. Right. And uh, I never shelled or anything. I went out the river to shell. I worked in the finishing department all the time. Right. Where the money finished. But I used to have to go down to uh, the company that I worked for. We had uh, uh, down off of Hershey Avenue. We had a cutting plant. And I would have to go down and tell the foreman, well, we needed so many lines of, of a certain blank and so many right. lines were back there, and uh, make out orders. And he, in turn, then would take and make sure that the fellows would cut, mm -hmm. cut out that amount. Now, this is one of the cutters of which 
uh, you cut uh, those banks out of those buttons. That had to be and with uh, running water, though, wasn't it? I mean, you yes. couldn't cut to well, well, take this, a saw and cut it into a raw shell. Yeah. It had to be wet, didn't it? This fit into a, in a, you know, we don't have a machine here, but this would fit into one end of the machine, which had a handle on it, and it would bring the, say, for instance, it would bring the, uh, this saw. saw up to here, and with that holder I had there, that would go and cut cut it out, and the blank then would go through here. Oh, I see. And fall into the bank. Then you could bring this back again and cut it again and cut what you could out. Well, then maybe you would chain saws and use the same or a different saw and cut some other sizes out, or you may take a shell out of what you were using there and throw it in the bucket, and somebody else would cut cut it out. So it. Uh, it was just a process of whichever they did. Now, this is just a blank uh, Two saw, uh, oh, yeah, that's without saw? any teeth is in it. That? Oh, I see, the teeth aren't. Yeah, there's no good. teeth. And this would be a file, and they had they usually have one or two guys that did nothing else but file, or sometimes you had to file your own. The teeth. And the and teeth, then. yeah. And that was the uh, the primary purpose of, of being a good filer. If you got a good sharp teeth, you would have more of a opportunity to make a good blank out of, out of that uh, I see. particular shell. Well, now we've got that much taken care of. Now let's go into the factories where these shells and, and uh, blanks was transported into big factories like mm -hmm. Weber's and Automatic and McKee's and this is just naming a few of yeah. them. Well, I worked at the Iowa Pearl for yes, 20 years. Yes, and uh, I worked at Mustang Pearl Works, too. It was with J&K now. But They're then there was some little places like uh, Perkins, perhaps, or something like that. I yeah. believe Perkins was more novelties later on. Yeah, or, and they cut, they cut blanks out, too. Uh, there's a lot of processes that went through before that button was completed that oh, yeah. wasn't there. I remember mm -hmm. the first job I had in a button factory. I had to sit at a big emery wheel. There was a lady sitting on the right of me, and there was men across from me. It was a oh, uh, place where they were working the same kind of job I was, see. Mm -hmm. So my job was to take this bark off of a blank, not the shell, but the mm -hmm. blank. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I'd done such a good job all day. I had more in my bucket than the lady next to me, see, that had worked there for years. And I thought, well, gee, that, I'm really good. But the next day, they brought the bucket back to me to be redone. I only had taken the outside bark. I hadn't got down yeah, into the second, bark. the second so bark. So that was my first job. Yeah. And then down in the basement, we had to go down and get our shell, our blanks, out of a, a tank put it into a dryer, dry those buttons, and carry the button up to, the bucket upstairs to work on. And downstairs they had grinders. And the women were sitting on both sides of these belts, these grinders, and these uh, blanks were going through them. And I could, there was one lady that was really good. She could take these two fingers and turn those blanks over like that. And I used to, little small shells, you know, and I used to be so amazed that she was so apt at doing that. Now, what do you know about grinding? Well, like you say, uh, you're, you're speaking about tanks. You had to go down there and get the, dank, uh, the, the, the uh, blanks out of the tank, which were soaked in water. Right. Now, that process was, was uh, followed through most, most of the way until they were polished, because if you left the blank lay too long, it would get dry and brittle, and then, then, then it would have a tendency to break a lot easier. But the grinding uh, would take, they would have it set so that it would grind a certain thickness. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, sometimes it, there would be some that wouldn't, wouldn't be quite as thick as the others, so then it would put it through what they call a classifier. That's what I was just going to ask you about the classifier. I yeah. knew that they were, uh, I uh, well, did they, remember about classifiers that well, they this, had. Well, this had a uh, uh, bucket or, or container on top where you would dump the blanks in, and there was two rollers, and you could set that roller so that the large ones would, would uh, go on through and the smaller ones would drop through, and each then it had buckets on each side, and that's where you would classify the different thickness of, of the button so that you can make different types of buttons out of them. And then they were dyeing the buttons when they were finished, and there was a churning, uh, wasn't yeah. there a certain amount of acid or something that they had to put in for churning to finish the 
yeah. blank, so it would be... Yeah, well, usually before before they got to that point, uh, uh, I think uh, you might mention that the, um, the blanks were brought up from the grinding room. Yes. And then put, placed into the automatic automatic machines, which made the eyes, the fish eyes, or the different patterns. And uh, this was all done one 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 operation. Well, that was a backer or a facer. Yeah, that. Yeah, it would either be a backer or a facer. Yeah. And I can remember a lady working in front of the backer, and uh, she had a pan in front of her, and then as the chuck come around, it would be open, and she would insert this button into it, and then it would go on around and finish mm -hmm. its. Yeah. Process. All right, they run on a track. Yes. And at a certain point, the track would raise up, and it would bring bring the chuck up so that maybe it would grind the button off, and then it would come around to where they would have a drill, and it would drill two or four holes, whichever they wanted in it, or, uh, and they also had places where they put pattern. That's why they called it automatic. The automatic, and that was from the Berry Company, wasn't it? Berry Manufacturing right. Company really invented that, wow. yes. And of course, uh, later, later on we could carry on in regards to uh, uh, making different fancier buttons, yes. than what, but it did. But that uh, mainly made like a fish eye and and uh, uh, with a round center on right. that used for underwear and that. Then as as they came from that machine, then they went into what they call a polishing room. Yes. And uh, the polishing room uh, had um, barrel type uh, containers. Oh, I I, was, I would say probably like a 50, 50 gallon barrel. Only they were straight, they weren't like a regular barrel. Didn't they polish those like overnight? It took well, so many it, hours. Well, it took so much polish. time, but they were set at an angle. The barrel was set at an angle, and there was a certain amount of water. And say, that, for instance, the, the, the polisher had a bucket full of blanks that he wanted to polish. He would dump them in there and start that barrel revolving around. And then there was a container above that, which you could put acid, the acid in. And they would put, uh, I don't forget whether it was sulfuric or muriatic first, but they would put one of the acids in and that would drip a drop at a time as these blanks were revolving around. And then when that got through, then he would put the other acid in, which would counteract the acid they had in there and would make the hard surface on, on the buttons. So that when later on, when the buttons were placed on the garment and that, and you wash them and wash them and wash them for years and years, that finish would stay on there. Right. Other, otherwise, it, they would just deteriorate. But that, that's what made their, their, uh, the finish on the button. Yes. And uh, then after they got done with that, they would take and uh, have what they call tumblers, which were filled with sawdust. Sawdust. Yeah, and these buttons would be wet in that. And then they would take and throw them in the tumblers and run them a certain while, and that would heat up more or less just from turning it around. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they would have a sieve that they would sieve that sawdust out and place the buttons in the button. Then they went upstairs. To then the they would go to the sorting. Sorting department, yes. yes. And I understand there was five different grades of sorting. <coughs> well, One, two, three, four, five. And uh, there were two grades for spots, like mm -hmm. you spoke about the spot on that shell. Yeah. And uh, two grades for pinks. That's yeah, nine see, different uh, grades. Uh, this doesn't, well, this doesn't have any pinks in, but some of them had pinks in. But like where this is white here, uh, when you got a good white perfect button, that was the number one button. They said there was only one perfect button that they ever cut out of a nigger head was a 17 line. Yeah. And that was right down near the hinge. Mm -hmm. But uh, the main object was to get as many of the first, second, third grade buttons out of right. it out of, of, of a bucket of buttons, for instance, because they would bring the bigger bigger prize. Yeah. And uh, then the experienced course, sorters made four or five dollars a week. Yes, and they would work from... Uh, Ten hours a day. Yeah, seven o'clock, uh, maybe they'd take a half hour, maybe sometime an hour for noon, and they'd work till 5.30, sometimes even till six o'clock. Right. And uh, they had no breaks or anything like that. And they sat there and sorted buttons in, the, in little boxes right. of different grades and different <laughs> things like that. They had belt sorting as well as table sorting. Yes, they, they eventually come up, come up to because belt Because I sorting. know I used to have four, 
four belts of women uh, on belts, you know, sorting mm -hmm. yeah. for different colors and things like that. But, uh, well, you, we've got our finished button now. Uh, uh, is there anything that you'd like to tell me about that sorting department, the women that you knew or something that was of importance? Well, when I, when I uh, went to get a job there, the, the uh, foreman took me up to the sorting room. That was the first place I went. Yes. As he took me around the factory. And uh, as I come up the steps, the first person sitting there sorting buttons was a young lady. She looked at me and I looked at her. And uh, about six weeks later, I finally got up on a nerve to ask her to go out on a date. And you and married the woman, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> we eventually got married in 1928. Uh -huh. we, were, we were married. Uh, there was also, uh, not that particular year, but there was a year that they had a pearl uh, queen here in Muscatine. Did yes. you know that? Mm -hmm. uh, she was in a parade, yeah. and uh, yeah, as I've read, um, our present president chose her out of seven girls. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was nice to know. There, there used to be some nice... Nice looking girls. Right. But it worked in the well, I'm glad for you. I know we had a lot of good times in the button factory. There's no questions about it. There was but, uh, things that happened that we'd like to relate, but we just don't have the time to do yeah. that. But I'd like to talk about some of the buttons. We talked about the shells and everything. Mm -hmm. These are the beautiful iridescent buttons. And they were sewed a lot of times at home. In fact, I carried buttons at 10 cents a week. And... Uh, my grandmother sometime had set up till midnight to get a buttons out so she could get that dollar and fifty cents a week. Mm -hmm. And anyway, these are some of the design buttons. Uh, I have a ring fish eye. It's a beautiful one. And I have a, this is designed on a hand machine. You insert the button into the machine and then you bring it up to a, a, a wheel and then it puts three little figures in them, they call a fish eye, and then you turn the machine and they'll put the other three in for you. And then I had what I had, uh, another one here. This is just a plain blank, but isn't it a beautiful rainbow color in there? I have another one back here. This is a strange one. This is a little smoky one, mm -hmm. and it has real silver in it. I thought at first it might be ocean pearl, but it isn't. It's oh, just, uh, it has silver in yeah. it, but it's real beautiful. Then we made cufflinks. On our hand machines, we made cufflinks, and heaven knows the thousands of gross I made. You take your little hook, put it between a little gauge there, and then you'd come down with a pressure here to put this together. We have two kinds of shanks. This one that I just showed you on the cufflink, which has the metal shank, and then we had the other one that was called self shank. The shank was made from the button itself. We have some wampum here. You know what wampum is? This is what the Indians used to trade when they wanted food or a saddle or a pair of boots. They would trade wampum. And this was pearl, but it only has one hole in it. And the strange thing about it, the little hook here has just a little blank that will fit into a hole here and bring it together for a necklace. Well, my wife and I, as far as talking about carding and also about making the wampum, we used to, after we worked all day, we'd take home a sack full of those buttons with the cards and the foil and set maybe until 10, 10 o'clock and sew buttons to make a little extra money. Because, right. Because in those days we didn't get too much money. It's, oh, yeah, then we had buckles. Then well, later on it was fancy, so we had buckles. Mm -hmm. These were also made on a hand machine. After they were cut out, then we designed them. So we had a little emery wheel, and we'd take a hold of both sides of the buckle and run it up and down an emery wheel. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. We enjoyed it. I remember one time we had some great big buttons, and they was all warped. And my job was to put them into a little stove. So I had two big mittens, asbestos mittens, and I'd put those warped buttons on cookie sheets, and I'd put them into this little stove and time them, how long I had them in there, and then pull them out and throw them into a tub of cold water. So they would flatten out. 
And in regards to the card button buttons there, they were mostly shipped to the five and ten cent stores and places like that where uh, if a person wanted to go in and, and buy a card of buttons, he could he could buy them uh, right. out, of, out of the five and right. dime store and stuff like that. And uh, the bulk buttons, uh, which uh, I don't think you got it to 22 there. Well, uh, usually the 22 line was like an underwear, what they call an underwear button. That wasn't the first grade, a 22. No, well, it depends. 24 or more so. Yeah. And uh, those would be sh shipped in bulk, like in 10 gross boxes, to uh, the manufacturers of shirts mm -hmm. or underwear or different things like that. And uh, when you were speaking of the spotted buttons, uh, those used to be made either into a smoke, what they call a smoke, right. or they'd be made into different colors. And Walter, those, let's shift away from buttons a little bit for the simple reason it wasn't all work, you know. You know, we had to have a little entertainment. Oh, and yeah. I remember we had parties. A lot of them. We used to have nice parties, and they used to play bingo, and we used to get silver dollars as, as mm. gifts. Can't you tell them about some of your entertainment that they used to have? Well, the 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 the, the most fun we had was uh, when the armory was there, where the theater is now on Third Street. Right. Used to be the armory, and uh, the uh, president of the company uh, in the afternoon would all our children would uh, go up there and they would uh, bring in clowns and different entertainment from Chicago Sounds and entertain good. the children in the afternoon. And then uh, at night, we would, he would hire a band out of Chicago, and we would have a, a large dance. And this went on for two or three years until finally uh, some rowdies came in one night and started dancing with some of the girls and causing trouble oh. and got into a fight, and we stopped it. Right. And uh, so then each department in the factory would have their own Christmas party. This was usually at, the, at Christmas time. Right. And uh, uh, we, uh, well, like the sorting department and the machine department, and they would all have their certain dinner. And I, I recall one, one time uh, the company always furnished the meat, and uh, as I was kind of an errand boy for the girls, I, they sent me up to Couch's, which was on Third Street at the, baking, uh, the, the bake shop, to uh, have three hams roasted. Yes. So I took them up the day before and told them I wanted them. We wanted them by 11 o'clock the next morning, or 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So, well and good, we'll have them for you. So, of course, they they did all of their their baking and that, and they were all done by the time I got up there about 11 o'clock. And I said, I come up to put the hams up for, for our dinner. Oh, my gosh, I forgot all about it. He opened the door, and there laid three Looked like three hunks of black coal. <laughs> and I, oh, gosh, he says, we forgot all about to take them out. And my old heart went up in my throat, and finally took them out and laid them on the table. Well, he said, I'll cut off what other stuff we can. Maybe we'll get some good out of it. <laughs> so he cuts it off, and here is about an inch and a half of dough, bread dough that had wrapped around there. And that black was nothing but the black dough. Right. And the most beautiful hands you ever had. Oh. My heart, I almost <laughs> stopped. Oh, that's great. You used to have ball games and uh, yes, bowling and things like that, didn't we? Anything yes. that kind of keep our interest as well as, you know, just the idea of working all the time. We won a city championship, I think, one year. I'm not uh, whether it was more than that or not. But I remember the former Murray Kelly Burns and yeah. Bobby Canan used to be the coach. And I'd like to go and on and on for hours, Walter, yeah. but I guess our time is short. And I'd like to leave a little sayings before we leave. Today we inherit the benefits that we had from yesterday, and tomorrow we will inherit the things we did today. Mm -hmm. And it's been such a pleasure in being here with you, Walter. And like I say, I'd be willing to go on for a longer time, but we just can't. We, our time is short. And I want to thank you for coming. Okay. And I, I have learned so much through this re review that we have had. And it just kind of brings back old times. And I want to thank my crew, and I want to thank for everybody that was involved in this program. Have a good time. I have a good day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. He 
East is East and West is West and the wrong one I have chose. Let's go where I'll keep on wearing those frills and flowers and buttons and bows, rings and things and buttons and bows. Don't bury me in this prairie, take me where the cement grows.